A songbook for the human heart. That's how our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, describes the book of Psalms on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus as we set off for another great adventure in God's Word. Now, throughout our study, you'll hear Dr. McGee refer to his notes and outlines for Psalms. So if you haven't gotten your free copy yet, well, they're available in a couple of different ways. First, you can download the notes and outlines for individual books of the Bible, including his notes for Psalms at ttb.org forward slash notes. Or Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for all 66 books are available in one resource that we call Briefing the Bible. You can download the ebook or order an abridged paperback copy at ttb.org forward slash Briefing the Bible. Now, before we dive into God's Word, Dr. McGee recorded a quick introduction for us. Let's listen to that now. Our study today brings us to the book of Psalms. Now, this is a book that many of you have heard me say. It it is my favorite book in the Bible. And as we go through it, and we're going to be here for a little while, I think you'll discover why I make that statement. And it is the song book for the human heart, and especially for the child of God. Now, we are doing something differently, as many of you know, of going through the entire Bible. But a listener wrote me a very interesting letter that John Gill, who lived from 1697 to 1771, he preached through the Bible, through the entire Bible, book by book and verse by verse. And you know how long it took him? It took him 45 years to go through the Bible like that. And I take it his entire ministry was spent going through the Word of God. And that's one of the things that makes the Bible such a wonderful book, because it's got 66 books that are all important. Each one of them is all important. And so if you don't have notes and outlines, write in and ask for them. This is a good place for you to begin in our five-year program. We'll send them to you, and you'll receive each month the notes together with a letter and also an editorial and any other news. We do not write bleeding heart letters, and we won't show you any pictures of a bunch of little starving orphans to try to move you. We believe that the only motive for anyone to give to getting the gospel out, is that the gospel and the word of God is being taught and that people are being reached. Heavenly Father, bless your word as it goes out now, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, it's a great thrill to me to come to the book of Psalms. Very candidly, again, I feel overwhelmed when I come to this marvelous book. It's actually in the very center of the Word of God. And Psalm, I suppose, 119 is the very center of the Word of God. And that is a great psalm that exalts the Word of God. And the book of Psalms, though, has been called the book of worship, or the hymn book of the temple. It's been a wonderful book that's blessed the hearts of multitudes down through the ages. I have found that when I have been sick and have been in the hospital or I have some problem that's pressing upon my mind and my heart and I wake up at night at times, I find myself always turning to the Psalms. I invariably turn there and read. And I find always that they bless my own heart and my own life. Apparently down through the ages, it's been that way. Ambrose, one of the great saints of the church, said the Psalms are the voices of the church. Augustine said they are the epitome of the whole Scripture. 
Martin Luther said, they are a little book for all saints. And John Calvin said, they are the anatomy of all parts of the soul. And I like that. Someone, I think, has said of the 126 psychological experiences, and I don't know where they got that number, by the way, that all of them are recorded in the book of Psalms and that it's the only book that has every experience that could happen to a human being. Every thought, every impulse, every emotion that sweeps over the soul are recorded in this book. That's the reason I suppose it always speaks to our hearts. It finds a responsive chord wherever we turn. And Hooker said, speaking of the Psalms, they are the choice and flower of all things profitable in other books. And Donnie put it, the Psalms foretell what any shall do and suffer and say. And that again is a wonderful statement. Herder called it a hymn book for all time. And Watts said, they are the thousand-voiced heart of the church. Now, I think we need to be probably a little bit more restrictive relative to the Psalms. The Psalms can be divided. For instance, there are Psalms that are known as pilgrim Psalms. There are Psalms that are known as imprecatory Psalms. There's many different classifications. I suppose the greatest is to say that there are messianic Psalms. And when we come to Psalm 2, we'll be talking about the Messianic Psalms. There are 16 of them in all. But privately and personally, I think that the book of Psalms, that there's not only 16 of them speaking of Christ. And, of course, that means they're quoted in the New Testament. But I think the 150 of them are all about Christ. I said at the beginning, this is a hymn book. And the hymn book, the way you spell him here is H-I-M. It's all about him. And I think as we go through the book of Psalms, we'll see that. But now in a more restrictive sense, the Psalms do have to do with Christ belonging to Israel and Israel belonging to Christ. Both are connected with the rebellion of man. There's no blessing to this earth until Israel and Christ are brought together. And the Psalms, I think, are Jewish in expectation and hope. And the worship of Psalms are actually Jewish. They're adopted, of course, to the temple. But that doesn't mean that they do not have a spiritual application and interpretation for us today, actually. They do, as I said. There's where I turn, and more probably than any other portion of the Word of God. But we need to be a little exact in our interpretation of the Psalms. Now, God is not spoken of as a father in the book of Psalms. The saints are not called sons. He was God the Father, but not the Father God. The Psalms know nothing of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And the blessed hope of the New Testament is actually not in the psalm. I think that is the thing that's led many astray in Psalm 2. The reference there is not the taking out of the church, but the reference to the coming of Christ there is his second coming to this earth to establish his kingdom, to reign in Jerusalem. All of that is in the book of Psalms. The psalms are actually full of the second coming of Christ. And there's judgment in the Psalms. And the judgment does not apply to Christians under grace by any means or to God's people that he's redeemed. The principle that runs through Psalms, the principle is stated in one Psalm, and I think probably I should reserve this for another time, but let me just mention it here. The principle that runs through the Psalms is that one Psalm states the principle and then there will be several psalms that will be explanatory. In fact, we'll start out with Psalm 1, and then we begin to move up. And it's just like going up a stairway. And then we come to Psalm 8, that great creation psalm that speaks of Christ. 
And so we will notice that there is always that ascending and also descending. And there are many other things that could be said about the Psalms. For instance, it's the inspired book of prayer and praise. It is the soul's anatomy, the soul's epitome. It is the garden of Scripture of 218 quotations of the Old Testament and the New Testament, 116 are from the Psalms. Now, probably I ought to spend a few moments talking about the writers of the Psalms. Now, some people think that David wrote all the Psalms. And the fact of the matter is, he did not write all the Psalms. He is the sweet psalmist of Israel, and 73 of the Psalms are assigned to him. Almost, very candidly, half of the book of Psalms. There are 150 of them. Now, he could be the author of some of what are known as the Orphanic Psalms. That means they're orphan Psalms. We do not know who the writer is other than the Holy Spirit. And this man, David, of course, was peculiarly endowed to write these songs from the experiences as well as a special, I think, aptitude and the fact that he's writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, he arranged those that were in existence in his day for temple use. And the writers are like this. 73, written by David. Moses wrote one, the 90th. Solomon wrote two. The sons of Korah wrote 11. Asaph wrote 12. Heman wrote one, and that's the 88. Ethan wrote one, the 89. Hezekiah wrote 10. And then there are 39 Orphanic Psalms. That is, we do not know who the human writer was. Now, again, may I emphasize, Christ the Messiah is prominent throughout. You will remember that the Lord Jesus, when he appeared after his resurrection to those that were his own. You remember what he had to say to them at that time. And I'll turn and read that because it's important to see. In Luke 24, verse 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. The Psalms speak of Christ. And as I have said, I think that is the most important thing to discover, that Christ is the subject of the Psalms. I think he is the one that's the subject of praise in every one of them, and doesn't mean I'll be able to locate him in all of them because I'm not able to. But that doesn't mean he's not there. It just means that Vernon McGee is quite limited. Now, that leads me to say that the key word in the book of Psalms is hallelujah. That is, praise the Lord. That has become a Christian cliche today. But that is something that ought to be the swelling of a great emotion of the soul. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And we'll find that the great 150th Psalm, by the way, is the key psalm. I feel like that is the one that probably tells out more than any other. And hallelujah occurs 13 times in six verses in this psalm, by the way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, again, let me go over this. The psalms record deeper devotion intense feeling, exalted emotion, and dark dejection. The Psalms play upon the keyboard of the human soul with all the stops pulled out. They run the psychological gamut. The book has been called, therefore, the epitome and the anatomy of the soul. And it's also been designated as the garden of the Scriptures. The place that Psalms have held in the lives of God's people, testifies to their universality. Yet they have a peculiar Jewish application, that is, for the nation Israel. They express the deep feelings of all believing hearts in all generations. 
And again, let me say it. The Psalms are full of Christ. There is a more complete picture of him in Psalms than in the Gospels. The Gospels tell us that he went to the mountain to pray, but the Psalms give us his prayer. The Gospels tell us that he was crucified, but the Psalms tell us what went on in his own heart during the crucifixion. The Gospels tell us that he went back to heaven, but the Psalms begin where the Gospels leave off and show us Christ seated in the heaven. There are many types of Psalms. And again, now let me go over this. This is important. All of them have Christ as the object of worship. Some are technically called Messianic Psalms. These record the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the glory, the priesthood, the kingship, and the return of Christ. There are the imprecatory Psalms, and they've caused most criticism, I think, because of their vindictiveness and prayers for judgment. Now, these Psalms come from a time of war and from a people who were under law, and they were looking for justice and peace on the earth. And friends, you can't get it without putting down unrighteousness and putting down rebellion. And God intends apparently to do just that. And he makes no apology for it. And he didn't even ask me to apologize for him. And I'm sure not going to. I think he's going to move in judgment on this earth. Now, the Christian is told to love his enemies. But here you find out there's some prayers that really are not very nice about the enemy. But it's to bring justice on this earth. And we'll look at them in time. And these Psalms, they look to a time coming on the earth when the Antichrist will be in power. Now, we have no reasonable basis to say how people should act and what they should say under these circumstances. Other types of Psalms, they're the penitential Psalms, the historic Psalms, the nature Psalms, the pilgrim Psalms, the Hallel Psalms, the missionary Psalms, the Puritan Psalms, the acrostic Psalms, and then praise of God's Word. Oh, this is a rich section that we're coming in here. We're going to mine for gold and diamonds here, friends. And then the book of Psalms are not arranged in a haphazard sort of way. Great many people think that they're arranged in just that way. I heard this statement made by a scientist. I have a statement in my book, How It All Began, and he said the chance of evolution working is just the same as taking all the letters of the alphabet and putting them in a tub and shaking them up and expect to bring out of it Webster's Dictionary. Just wouldn't come together like that. Now, a great many people think that the Psalms were dropped in a tub or a barrel and shaken up, and then when they were brought out, that's the way they were put together. But they are arranged orderly. Fact of the matter is, it's been noted for years that the book of Psalms are arranged and correspond to the Pentateuch of Moses. There's the Genesis section, and there is the Exodus section, And I have that in my notes and outlines. But let me give it to you just in case you're riding along in a car. You can't look at the notes or maybe you don't have them. The first 41 Psalms are the Genesis section. The Exodus section begins with Psalm 42, goes through 72. The Leviticus section begins with Psalm 73, goes through 89. The Numbers section begins with Psalm 90 goes through 106, and the Deuteronomy section begins with Psalm 107, goes through 150. Now, you have a real correspondence. For instance, in this Genesis section that we're going to come to, why you have here man seen in a state of blessedness. That's Psalm 1, the perfect man. And then you have the fall and the recovery of man in view. Psalm 1 is the perfect man. Psalm 2, the rebellious man. Psalm 3, the perfect man rejected. Psalm 4, conflict between the seed of the woman and the serpent. Psalm 5, the perfect man in the midst of enemies. 
Psalm 6, the perfect man in the midst of chastisement, the bruising of his heel. And Psalm 7, the perfect man in the midst of false witnesses. And Psalm 8, the repair of man comes through man, the bruising of the head. All of this is here at the beginning, and we're going to see it in each one of the Psalms. But we're not going to be able to see very much today as we come, first of all, to Psalm 1. We're told as we come now to this. In fact, Spurgeon put it like this. He says, The book of Psalms instructs us in the use of wings as well as words. It sets us both mounting and singing. And this is the book will make a skylark out of you instead of maybe a, another kind of bird, you see. A hundred and fifty spiritual songs set to music for the tabernacle and temple. And I think every one of them was set to music. I think if David didn't write some of them, he certainly is the one that set them to music, those that were written in his day. Now we come here in this very first psalm to the blessed man or the happy man. And the blessed man here, yes, Adam put in the Garden of Eden, but Adam fell. Who is really the blessed man? Well, I think Psalm 1 is actually a picture of Christ, though it's not quoted in the New Testament as such. But I believe it's a picture of him. And the blessed man here is contrasted to the ungodly man. And this is the psalm which opens the Genesis section. It begins with man instead of the material universe. The blessed man here is not the first Adam, but I think the last Adam. Because it starts off, blessed is the man, happy is the man. And now it gives the practice of the blessed man. Verse 1, the negative side. Verse 2, the positive side. And here the blessed man is not in an ideal garden of Eden, but he's in the midst of the ungodly, and the sinners, and the scornful. And we're going to see how he does. So let me just get my foot in the door as we come to the conclusion of our study today. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now do you notice the steps here? The man starts out walking, and then he gets into the counsel of the ungodly, and they get him to stand, and before long, we see him now no longer walking, but he's standing in the way of sinners. And the sinners get him to sit down, and now we find him sitting in the seat of the scornful. Now you start out with the ungodly, and then you come to the sinners, and then the scornful. And actually, what you have here are the three steps, I think, of sinners today. There are different classes and condition of sinners some are worse than others. The ungodly, well, they just leave God out. And the sinners are openly, they are definitely committing sin. That's the reason they're sinners. And the scornful, they have rejected God. They are now looking down upon God. Well, these are the three. You have three types of sinners and three positions. The man standing, walking, sitting. We'll look at that next time and we'll get into Psalm 1. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. It's going to be a terrific study. I hope that you'll join us and invite your family members and friends to hop aboard the Bible bus for the journey. If you'd like to share today's message with them, then direct them to listen online anytime at ttv.org. That's also where you'll find a listing of local radio stations that carry this program. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, the notes and outlines for Psalms that Dr. McGee referred to can also be found at ttv.org in a couple of different ways. Just type in ttv.org forward slash notes to check out the options. Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find the resources that you need. And when you do contact us, make sure you tell us how and where you listen to Through the Bible. Whether you're listening online, through an app, or your local radio station, or by any other means, we want to know. As always, this little bit of information really helps us make important decisions and be the best possible stewards of the resources that God entrusts to us through the faithful donations of friends like you. Thanks in advance for your help. 
Now, to prepare for our study of Psalms chapter 1, I'm going to read through it tonight and pray for our upcoming time in God's Word. Why don't you join me? If you'd like to read the text and pray before each of our studies, we offer a handy bookmark with the schedule. So to download your free copy, visit ttb.org forward slash bookmark or sign up for our mailing list to receive it automatically along with our great newsletter that's packed with more teaching from Dr. McGee and ways to pray and get involved with Through the Bible. You can sign up online at ttb.org or by giving us a call, again, the number 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you right back here tomorrow as we continue this great journey through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.